inside are loads of books. Oh my god! This is amazing! It's like Christmas! But better? Maybe better. So for those of you who don't already know me, I love books. I love all kinds of books. I love romance novels, I love fantasy novels, I love hardbacks and paperbacks, and especially I love witchcraft books. Witchcraft, paganism, folklore, legend, history, these kind of books are my favourite, and my favourite publishing house is Troy Books. And recently they announced that they were discontinuing their metallic foil print hardbacks. Now if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about this. This kind of hardback is my absolute favourite, and because Troy Books is a book publishers that I do collect, I might have perused their website sale, I might have purchased the majority of the books that I didn't already have in my collection in hardback or special edition. And by saying might, I mean I definitely did because I have a ginormous box in front of me that looks like this. <laughs> So, um, yeah, this is box one of two. I might have gone through the entirety of their store. Maybe. <laughs> so I'm so excited. Let's open them. Uh -huh. I am a liability. Why don't I just own a box cutter? Instead, I'm just using a pair of scissors. <laughs> ah, okay inside are loads of books. Oh my god! Okay. <laughs> this is amazing. It's like Christmas. But better? Maybe better. Before we get to opening these things, I do really feel the need to point out that no one, not a single person, needs this many books, especially not on one subject. You do not need loads of books to practice witchcraft, you do not need loads of books to be a successful practitioner, however, this is my niche obsession, this is my special interest, <laughs> it's also my job, it's my passion, it's my hobby, and so I did go a little bit bonkers. Um, when I saw that they were having this sale on their website. So um, yeah, I'm sorry if this seems like a little bit much, but this is like the one thing that I am completely obsessed over. And I know that so many of you also love witchcraft books and want to learn more about them. So hopefully this is entertaining to any of you who are also like me and completely obsessed with witchcraft books, especially hardbacks and special editions. If this isn't you, feel free to skip this video, that's fine. I just thought that some of you might really appreciate this, so we're gonna do it. I actually, I don't know where to look first. I actually don't know where to look first. So I already have a small-ish collection of Troy Book hardbacks and special editions, but unfortunately I didn't manage to get all of the ones that I wanted before they stopped doing the foil print, so I'm really sad about that, but maybe one day I'll be able to find them. So this is essentially gonna add to my already growing <laughs> Troy Book collection. Now I do want to say that Troy Books aren't getting rid of their hardbacks or their special editions, it's just they're changing them to be, um, what are they called, dust covers, like dust jackets. I'm gonna be brutally honest here, I hate dust covers on books. I can't stand them. They rip, they're annoying, they get in the way, they make noise, that's the thing, they make noise. I don't like my book to be making noise while I'm like holding it, I don't like that. Um, they get crinkled really easy. I just, I really don't like dust jackets. And so for me, when I saw that I could get them with the foiling, I had to get as many as I could because I love their books but I hate dust covers. Let me know, maybe we can do like a poll somewhere of do you like hardback books with dust covers or do you prefer them without? Because I feel like I can't be alone here, <laughs> but maybe I am. So I think we're gonna start with the small one first. Oh my god, I'm so excited. <gasps> oh my god, it's, oh it's textured. Oh my goodness, that is lovely. 
So some of you will, I don't know what noise that was. That was a non-human noise. Some of you will recognize what book this is immediately. This is The Devil's Dozen, 13 Rights of the Old One by Gemma Gary. I have this in a paperback and I loved it so much that I wanted to get it in the hardback as well. Now, I'll be honest, some of these are hardbacks, some of them are special edition. I did order a few pre-order special editions so they aren't gonna be included in this. So I'm not really sure which ones are special edition and which ones are hardback without double checking, but oh, it's beautiful. And this is why I like the foiling so much. It just adds something so special to it. And then you've got the foiling down the edge as well with the name of the book. And it's just so, so beautiful. And then inside you have the images as well on shiny paper and you have the same illustrations. Oh my God. <laughs> Best day ever. Best day. Right. Where am I going to put these? I'm going to put them there really, really carefully. So I think I'm going to unbox them all first to get them out of the uh, crinkly packaging. And then we're going to go through and talk about what each book is about. That way, if you're just here to look at the pretty books, that's the first bit. If you want the more nitty gritty details, we can talk about that in the second bit. So the next one is really tiny. Look at this. This is the Chalmers I never say this right, Salter, P-S-A-L-T-E-R by Gemma Gary. This is one I have not read before. I have seen this in the paperback when I've been in Courtyard Books and I have never ever considered getting it because I don't work with the Psalms. However, when I saw that this was in the sale, I thought, mm, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to because it's Gemma Gary. So it's in my collection and some of you might find this really, really useful. There's a lot of bubble wrap. My, do you remember at the start of the year when I said I'm not buying any more books till I have kind of read some of my to be read pile? Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, that went out the window real quick. <laughs> like real quick. I think I know, I think I can just tell what this is just by looking at it. Oh my God, okay. Oh. These ones are not as textured as the um, the other ones. So what do we have here? Oh, sorry, I just saw I just saw the one underneath. Oh, that's exciting. This is the one I've been looking forward to. But anyway, so the first up we have this one. Now I believe that this one is the Cornish Traditional Year. Yeah, it is. This is the Cornish Traditional Year by Simon Reed. Oh, it's beautiful. It's not as big as I thought it was going to be. Actually, I thought this one was going to be bigger. But one that I was so excited for is this one. This is Gallo Men and Mandrakes, The Occult Life of Bob Laurentis Reichel, or Reichel, I never know how to say it. If you have been to the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, the collection that this book is talking about is in the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. If I can, I will try to put some clips on the screen of the collection so you can see what I'm talking about. But in the museum, you do have the Mandrake collection, and you essentially have collections that belong to different people that were really significant in the occult community and in the history of it and this book is all about it and this one is a big one this is about what I was expecting for it I've had my eye on this for years like what well, I say for years well since I first saw that this book was in print I was so looking forward to it oh my god and there's pictures <gasps> oh actually saying that there's actually images in here wait let me see if I can get them there's images in here. I don't want to open the book too much. This is the collection in the museum. Of course, if you haven't been to the museum, it's amazing, like legitimately amazing. If you're interested in witchcraft, if you're not, then you're not going to like it. But well, I mean, you might, but it's definitely for the witchy minded folk. You can get so much inspiration from it. And ah, I'm so excited. I'm going to have to finish the books I'm currently reading because I'm partway through Blackthorn Whitethorn. And I'm also partway through, um, Wished Waters by Gemma Gary. So both of them are Troy books and partway through both of them. So I feel like I need to like hurry up and finish them and then I can start this. Am I overly excited about books? 
Yes, some might say it's a problem. I am just going to refer to it as a personality quirk. <laughs> okay. Ah, okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? Okay. Oh, this is big. These ones are really big. So, oh, look at the size of these. Ah, okay, what about this one? Oh, and this one's just as big. <gasps> okay, we get it. Okay. <laughs> I need to chill out. I need to calm the fuck down. Okay. Lots of bubble wrap. I'm still going. I'm still going. Where's the end? Where's the end? Oh. God, look at that. Look at this one. <gasps> That's amazing. Okay. It's so the one thing I have noticed with the Troy Book books is that every cover feels slightly different in texture. So an example would be if you look at the texture of this, can you see it's got almost like this dimple effect on it? And then some of them are almost like... Um, it's almost like parchment paper. And then some of them, like this one here, are like leather. They're, I've noticed that they aren't uniform in like how they do them, which is interesting. Maybe it's a choice of the author. Maybe it's just based off the size of the book or, or what they wanted. Oh my God, it's beautiful. That's, that's actually stunning. <gasps> Okay, so this was one that I was actually not 100% certain on. I was very much on the fence as to whether I was going to get it. This is Bounded in a Nutshell, Lockdown Magic and Infinite Space by Val Thomas. This one was written, it's, it's almost like a personal diary or journal of their progression in magic through lockdown and everything that happened in 2020. And I'd seen this one and I thought, hmm to get it, to not get it, to get it, to not get it. I ended up not getting it when I was in Glastonbury, but then when I saw it, I am actually wondering if this might be a special edition and that's why it looks different. Yeah, this is special edition. Okay, so that's why this one looks different. So they do a collection of different versions. So they have a standard paperback, they have a standard hardback, they have a black edition, which is basically all black with a black print on the front. I've got to say, I'm not a massive fan of it because you can't tell which book is which because they all kind of blend in. And then they do the special edition. So this one looks like this because it's the special edition. <gasps> oh, it's beautiful. Oh my God, okay, next. <laughs> Okay, so we then have, ooh, The Willow Path, Witchcraft, Hermetics, and the Hidden Wisdom of the Magical Arts by Kerry Wisner. This one I have seen before, and it's one where every time I'm in Courtyard Books and I see it, I'm like, oh, to get it, to not get it, to get it, to not get it, I ended up getting it, and it's really pretty. I've got to say, blue is not my favourite colour. Like, I just, I'm not a massive fan of blue, but this blue and copper is a really nice choice. And then, what's this? <laughs> okay. This is a symbol many of you will immediately recognize as being associated with Gemma Gary, the one, the only. This is Traditional Witchcraft, a Cornish Book of Ways hardback. Oh, it's so pretty. I so wish I could have got the special edition for this, but alas, that's not how it went. But this one is really pretty. So I now have three different versions of this book. Some might call it a tad obsessed. Um, some might say completely delusional, but um, I now have three versions of this. So I like getting to have like the differences between them. So I have the original print, I've got the standard hard, no, I've got the standard paperback and now I have the standard hardback. <laughs> Do I have a problem with books? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think I might, okay. And now we have the last three and these Oh, are so beautiful. Maybe I'll just pull them out. Oh, that's so pretty. This one is a different texture. Again, this one is completely smooth. That's really interesting. It has a little mark on the front of it, but that is really pretty. This is From Granite to Sea, Folklore of Bodmin Moor and East Cornwall by Alex Langstone. Oh, okay. You know I'm a sucker for green. 
I'm an absolute sucker for it. Green walls, green books of shadows, green everything. Like my living room is mostly green. <laughs> green rug, green cushions, green chair, green curtains. I I have an, a love of green, so this one is very, very nice. Oh my goodness, look at these. <gasps> okay, so the first one is beautiful. Oh my God, that's gorgeous. <gasps> Okay, what the hell? That's amazing. This is Etruscan Roman Remains by G.S. Leland. Or Leyland. I, I've said that name so many times and I always get it wrong. It's by Charles G. Leland, essentially. And is this a standard hardback? Yeah, this is the standard hardback. And it is beautiful. It actually surprised me that this is the standard hardback because that is absolutely stunning. Dunning. And then the last one that I got is The Book of Witches by Oliver Maddox Hufer. And this one is just beautiful. Oh, look how reflective. Oh my God, that is absolutely amazing. I just, oh my God. Now, I will be honest and say that I missed out on so, so many. I have a kind of small but growing, obviously growing now collection of the Troy Book hardbacks, but I love the foiled ones. And I wanted to get as many as I could. And there was a specific set that I wanted to get. So I have the um, the Gnome Grimoire, which is the, the second of a collection of three. And I had full intention of going and getting the first and the third, and then I never did. And now I probably never will and it's so infuriating i am hoping that when they start releasing the um dust jacketed ones that i like them uh i mean i probably won't i'll be honest i really have a thing with dust jackets i just don't like the way they look so i don't know how that's gonna work maybe i'm gonna have to hunt hunt down the versions that i need and see if i can get hold of them but i'm so excited. I don't even know which one I'm going to read first. Like, I actually, I don't know. Do I go for the smaller ones first to give myself that sense of accomplishment? You know, if you, if you pick a small book, then you can read more of them and then you feel better about yourself. Whereas if you pick like a, a 700 page book, it only counts as one book. If I can find the meme I'm referencing here, I'm going to put it right here. It's a Lord of the Rings thing where it's like, it still only counts as one. And Gimli's like screaming at Legolas. That's how I feel when I'm reading like a ginormous book. I feel like I've read like five books and it's actually just one. And it drives me insane. So I'm going to look at all this. They are very well packaged. I've only... I've only ever had one book from Troy Books come damaged, and I'm so sad about it. It was the special edition Blackthorn Whitethorn. It came with, like, melted, like, the back was melted on it, on, like, a little section, like, it had touched something hot, um, which it happens. I mean, it the contents of the book are still exactly the same. It's just kind of sad that that happened, so I wanted to unpack these, like, quickly so that I could see um, if there was any damage and they all look really, really, really good. So, I mean, to be fair, they're very, very good at what they do. They're a great publishers. They really care about the authors that they put out and how people receive their product. And so I'm chuffed with all of these. Shall we start going through what each of them is about? Um, I'm gonna start at the earlier ones. So I'm just gonna do them in the order that I um, pulled them in basically so that we can work our way through them. Oh my god. So first up we have The Devil's Dozen by Gemma Gary. This one is just unbelievably beautiful. Like it is absolutely stunning. It has the most amazing texture. I think this one might actually be my favourite to look at. It's got this very almost like weather-worn cover but in like the best the best way. So I actually have the paperback version of this. So this is what the paperback looks like versus, if I can get the book the right way around, the hardback. It's basically going to be the same content in each. What I'm quite surprised at, however, is the fact that this one seems so much thicker than this one. Like if I can compare them, I don't know, it just seems so much thicker somehow, which is interesting. So, the information on this one goes as follows. The operations of magic and witchcraft deal with the hidden worlds of spirit and the powers innate within the natural world. 
The Old One, who in folk tradition is often named the Devil, embodies the rend in the veil between the worlds of the material and spiritual, the revealed and the hidden. It is through union with this entity that the witch awakened their powers and gained access to those residing within the hidden realms and the natural world. In traditional folk belief, the devil existed also as an embodiment of the chaotic forces of nature, a figure quite distinct from the church's Satan. To the witch he might also represent the darker aspects of the divine, the revealer of the mystic light, the guide of souls, and the sentinel at the threshold unto the mysteries of death and the other world. Something, it would seem, of the Elder God and the Old Spirit of the Wild has lingered through regional fairy lore, the calendar of ritualistic seasonal folk customs, and traditions attached to the ancient landscape features. The themes of untamed nature, its freedom, spirit, and magic, so repugnant and threatening to the Church, were grafted onto the diabolical, affording further preservation of the Old One. Witch law records varied rites of initiatory contact, via which the worker of magic entered into a close, working union with the Old One and the spirit world. Such union opened the ways unto curing ailments, exercising ill influence, attaining desire and the destruction of the oppressive via the old arts of the circle, spirits, knotted cord, pierced candle, witch bottle, magical image and charms, spoken, inscribed and herbal. From this wellspring of inspiration, The Devil's Dozen, a modern grammary or black book of rites has been created and is offered by a present-day initiate of the old craft. Within its pages, there are to be found 13 rites of vision, sacred compact, dedication, initiation, consecration, empowerment, protection, illumination, union, transformation, and devotion. That's a lot, and also, can we see? They've put orange text on a green background. That is like a dyslexic's worst nightmare. That is so, so hard to read. But this book is one that I did really enjoy. I have a full review of it, I believe, on my Patreon, if that's something that you are interested in. The only thing that I did say about it, I believe, if I'm remembering the review correctly, is that a lot of the rights might be a little too item heavy and also might not be safe for everyone to do. So for instance, being naked out in a wild area might be fine if you live in an area that's very sheltered, if you live in a place that is not very well populated perhaps and you feel safe and comfortable doing that but for a lot of people they might not feel that way so just bear that in mind adapt the workings as you need to if you do want to carry them out or just take them as a really interesting bit of information that you can draw on within your own magical practice so yeah this is one where i mostly got it because i enjoyed reading it in this version and i wanted to get the hardback version and also there's just something about it that means having this version, this beautiful, old-fashioned, very fancy version just makes me feel like I'm in a Discovery of Witches or something. <laughs> I feel like I should be sitting in the Bodleian Library and that is peak goals, is to be sitting reading in the Bodleian Library. So I'm chuffed with this one. So next up we have the Charmers <sighs> Salter. I don't know how to say that because it's Psalm. Like you take the P off it and it's Psalm. And this is it's like P, Salter. So my brain goes, it must be Salter, the Charmer's Salter. I might be completely wrong there. Please let me know if I am. Either way, <laughs> this is what it looks like on the front. It's really, really small. And then down the side, you have the beautiful gold embossed writing. It is just so, so pretty. This one is really, really tiny though. And inside is exactly what you would expect a whole collection of psalms for magical use. Now, you might be thinking that that sounds really counterintuitive, but the only reason folk magic has survived is that it adapted and shifted to the modern trends of religion. It's the only way it wasn't completely pushed out of society, essentially. And so a lot of the charms that we do have, physical as well as verbal, that were found, especially during the early modern period, do contain a large amount of Christian text as well as psalms because it was a way for it to become socially acceptable for the time. And so while I don't use them in my own practice, 
other people certainly do and it's a very valid form of practice. So I wanted to get this because I get a lot of questions from people asking about psalms for magical use and I had no real idea of what could be used. And so I'm going to give this a read and see what it says about them because this might be interesting to a lot of you who are interested in that kind of combined practice. The Psalms, mysterious in their origins and possibly far predating their appearance within Judo-Christian scripture, have a long history of magical use. We encounter the Psalms within the rites and talismanic magic of the grimoires and their prolific employment within charming, cunning and folk magical tradition. Herein, the methods of their use are varied and incorporate magical acts of utterance, inscription, bottling, burning, sprinkling, pouring, and burial in conjunction with various substances and materials. Serving a vast array of needs, principles for healing, protection, and the averting of evil, but also long employed within acts of cursing, the Psalms are an established feature of traditional operative magic, and yet also used for engaging the world of spirit, the divine, and the unseen. The Charmer's Psalter is born from a personal working collection of magical psalms and other verbal charms, here presented in a convenient pocket book so that it may be always on hand to the contemporary charmer for reference should the need arise. So this is one where I'm curious to learn more about it. Not every topic I learn about is one that I'm going to actively include within my magical practice, this being one of them. However, I do think it looks incredibly interesting and so I'm definitely going to give this a read and let everyone know what I think about it. Oh my god, there's illustrations! Look, there's pictures in here! Like actual, like, shiny photographs. I love it when they do that. It just gives a reference point that we can go off. <gasps> Wait, there's a Mary Lewis. Cool. It just gives so much additional information. Like, here we have what looks to be a May Day celebration. Yeah, the Padstow Maypole. Padstow is so beautiful as well, if you haven't been. Anyway, it just gives kind of a reference point to figure out what's been spoken of, so then you can have the images of it. I just really enjoy it when they do that. So, up next, we have the Cornish Traditional Year by Simon Reed. I will say, this one isn't my favourite looking hardback. I think, ultimately, it comes back to the fact that it is blue. And I am not a fan. I'm not a massive fan of blue, but I did want to get this because I've seen this for a good few years and I've always put off getting it. I've always gone for something else, but I'm really, really fascinated in how customs and traditions are kept alive through the celebrations, especially regional celebrations. And Cornwall has such a rich history that this kind of book could be really useful to gain more insight out of. So this one has much less information than the last two. This one says, Just as the language of Cornwall is crucial to the continued survival of the Cornish people, so it is equally crucial to practice and understand our distinctive Cornish calendar. This book presents to all the people of Cornwall the full exposition of the yearly cycle that forms such an important part of our culture. Celebrating together leads to strong communities and a positive sense of identity. By adopting, reviving, or preserving this heritage, we take giant steps towards ensuring the future of the Cornish culture into the 21st century and beyond. Now, I know that a lot of my followers aren't from the British Isles, and so you might not know this, but Cornwall does have its own language, and it has a really, really rich history, loads of traditions, folklore, customs, and cultures. And so being able to have a book like this to learn more about it so that those kind of traditions don't get lost, I think is really useful. And so even though this isn't necessarily witchcraft. I think it is really nice to have something like this so that we can learn and continue to understand the traditions of regional locations because just like the UK has lots of regional accents, it also has a lot of regional customs as well and that's why traditional witchcraft, whether you're Cornwall, Devon, whether you're Essex, Somerset, whether you're further north, it's going to vary very very dramatically and it's because of customs like these. Where am I going to put this? I'm going to put it there. Next. <laughs> okay, this, this, this is the one. This is Gallo Men and Mandrakes, The Occult Life of Bob Laurentis Reichel or Reichel. I still need to double check which that is by Wilmar Tal. And this one is just, I mean, isn't that just stunning? It has the black with the copper. It is Honestly, my favourite combination of colours, I think, is the black with the copper. I'm a sucker for it. This is just beautiful. Oh my god. It's beautiful. 
I just want to read it. But I need to hold back. Oh, but look at that. It's got all the illustrations. I'm pulling the weirdest faces. Oh, but look at that. It's got all the illustrations. Oh, it's so beautiful. Wait. Exciting. Okay, sorry, I'm getting sucked into it. I need to tell you what it's all about. Okay, an update now that I've checked the website. This is actually the special edition. That's why it looks like this. Um, the standard hardback is apparently no moon and this is in the center and it's a different kind of texture. So that's why the texture of this one is so nice and interesting. It's because this one is the special edition. And this one is described as such. On the first floor of the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic in Boss Castle, the Rachel collection stands out through its quality and volume. The former steward of this collection was Amsterdam-based collector and presumed occultist Bob Rachel. Although the collection consisted mostly of works and objects fashioned by his father-in-law, J. H. W. Eldermans, Bob was quite an accomplished artist himself. He was skilled in woodworking, casting metals, but most of all, he was a splendid draftsman. Contrary to his father-in-law, Bob was an artist. He played with layers of meaning, his drawings flowing from his subconscious by starting with a single dot on paper, watching the depiction grow as he proceeds. His works deal with his perpetual fear of a nuclear war, his trauma from World War II, his fascination with the devil, the dark sides of Roman Catholicism, and of course, themes of the occult. This is the world in which Bob raises his children, makes his art in the early hours and late at night, producing drawings that even have a story to tell in the 21st century. And this is all essentially about the life of this incredibly fascinating man. And I am very excited to give this one a read. I know it's going to be really dense to get through because it's very history heavy, but these are the figures that I think we need to all collectively learn more about. And hopefully this book will be good and I can recommend it to anyone who's also interested. And if you've also been to the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic and have been fascinated as I was by this collection, I just stood there staring at it because there's just so much intrigue in it. It's very unusual, it's very captivating and it really does draw you in, or at least it drew me into it. I just wanted to look at everything in the entire collection. Then I think that you will probably enjoy learning more about this as well. So this one, I'm dreading reading because it's gonna be really, really dense, but I know it's gonna be really good. This next book might not be for everyone because it does focus around the events of 2020 and all of the lockdowns and everything surrounding it. So if you do wanna skip listening to this just a little, I will leave a timestamp on the screen so that you can skip over it. So up next, we have Bounded in a Nutshell by Val Thomas. I have to say this one is incredibly beautiful and then it has the print this way up actually on the spine, which is really, really lovely. It's gorgeous. Like it, it's legitimately beautiful. It is huge. Like how many pages is this? Actually, okay, it it's not as many pages as it looks. It's 470 something pages. I have novels that are bigger in pages, but they they look this size, so I'm going to assume it's probably just bulk. It's bulk. It's still a lot of pages, but it's not as bad as I as I feared it was going to be. But this is one that I looked at, I was curious about, and I always put it back and I didn't get it. But when I saw that this was basically my last opportunity to get this version of it, I had to. Bounded in a nutshell, Lockdown, Magic and Infinite Space is a magical diary of the COVID-19 pandemic, covering 2020 to 2022. Written at the time, as events unfolded worldwide, it charts the various lockdowns from the perspective of a witch, drawing on her magical training and experience to cope with the situation to protect, as far as possible, herself and her community, to learn from the situation and seek guidance for the future. While largely confined to home, just like the rest of the population, the author embraces the present, yet travels in time and space by working with magical memories, history, folklore, fiction, 
plant knowledge and enchantments of various kinds. Thus, the diary offers a heady blend of observations, stories, spells, recipes, ritual and personal insights. It is one witch's personal account of an extraordinary time, but it also shows the importance of the magical community, both locally and internationally, and how much can be achieved when practitioners pool their power and intention to work for a common end. We can be bounded in a nutshell physically, but there is no limit to how far our minds can travel and the enchantment we can bring to our own lives and the lives of those around us. Next up, we have the Willow Path. Now, this is actually called The Willow Path, Witchcraft, Hermetics, and the Hidden Wisdom of the Magical Arts by Kerry Wisner. And I'm a sucker for the copper, as I said earlier. It is just so beautiful, and it has the text just down the side in that same metallic. This one is kind of hefty, actually. And again, we do have this little bit... <gasps> it's a cat! Oh my god! <laughs> It's a cat! It has the pictures in the middle of the book. Oh, I'm a sucker for cats. I love them so much. I love all animals, but there's just something about a cat and a black cat. Oh, that's so cute. Um, anyway, it has the pictures in the middle of the book, which I do really appreciate, was what I was going to say before I got distracted by a cat. Okay. You should see what I'm like when I'm walking down the street and I see a cat. I will stop dead, crouch to the floor and see if it's willing to approach me. I look bonkers when I do it, especially if there's loads of people around. But if there's a cat, I have to say hi to the cat, otherwise it's rude. <laughs> I'm not just gonna keep walking and pretend I haven't just seen one of the cutest animals to ever exist, right? That, that would be even more bonkers if I did that. Anyway, <laughs> the information on this goes as follows. Deep in the New England forests, a stone circle lays hidden, nestled in a clearing high atop a mountain of granite. Formed in the pattern of many old stone walls which dot the region, it is here that the willow path emerges from the land itself. In nature, there exists an underlying current, a continuity of wisdom and consciousness that manifests in the magical arts. With roots reaching to Basque witchcraft, the Willow Path is a form of magical arts that incorporates techniques drawn across the rich tapestry of Western occult practices. From the oral teachings of traditional witchcraft, combined with hermetics, the Willow Path blends these into a cohesive magical practice. Much of this material has never been published, as it represents the actual methods taught by the author through personal instruction and intensive training. This book discusses the other worlds and realms employed in the art, the stang or witch's staff as the tree rising through the worlds, sun and moon tides, the witch's foot and elemental forces, tools of the art, companions of the art such as familiar spirits, the miller's stone and cloak of Danu, the use of numbers, colours and directions, and the wheel of... I'm never going to be able to say that. I... I'm going to put it on the screen, because I'm never going to be able to say that without butchering it. The Willow Path is a culmination of teachings that seek to carry the heritage and wisdom of the magical arts forward, allowing one to shape reality as one would bend the osseous of the willow itself. So this one looks so, so interesting. I'm not sure if it's one where I will employ the work within my own practice, or whether it's one that I simply will enjoy learning about and just understanding how other people choose to practice. And I think that is really important to remember is that all of the books that we read don't necessarily have to be added into our own magical practice. Sometimes it's just really interesting to learn how other people experience the world, view the world, how they perceive their spiritual and magical practices and how they're undertaken. It doesn't mean that we are Ourselves have to add that into our own practice. Sometimes it can be just something that we want to learn about and I kind of feel like that's what this is going to be for me. While it sounds really fascinating, I'm not sure how much I'm actually going to add or whether I'm just going to enjoy it for what it is, which is just a really interesting book. Ooh, bah. Traditional Witchcraft, A Cornish Book of Ways. I love this book. I've already done reviews of this book before and I absolutely adore it. So this one I'm so happy I managed to get. It has the beautiful labyrinth on the cover and then down the side we have the same copper foiling. I have said it before in this video, I'll say it again, I do think the copper foiling is my favourite. There's something about it that is just extra, ooh, ooh, and I really like it. It's just so, so beautiful. So, I actually have the standard paperback version of this, 
and now you can compare it with the hardback. So they've gone with the same red theme, which I really, really appreciate. They're both about the same thickness. I definitely just turned that the wrong way, just pretend I didn't do that. And yeah, I think mostly they're going to be exactly the same. So if you have this, you do not need to have this as well, unless you are, like me, obsessed with collecting books. <laughs> so do not feel the need to get the hardbacks when they have paperbacks available for really affordable prices. So the information on this one goes as follows. Although nestled in the Cornish landscape and its lore, the beliefs and practices described in this book are rooted also in the traditional witchcraft current and an old craft of multiple British streams. Its magic and charms are comparable also to those found elsewhere in the British Isles and beyond, making this book adaptable for practitioners in any land. Traditional Witchcraft, A Cornish Book of Ways is a 21st century version of traditional Cornish witchcraft, of the kind recorded by Hunt, Bottrell and others. This is no neo-pagan or modern Wiccan manual, but rather a deep drawing up into modern times of some of the ancient practices of law and magic practiced by the white witches, charmers, conjurers and pellers of the Cornish villages. Their presence was still current when the 18th and 19th century antiquarians and collectors recorded them, and although the 20th century largely put pay to their activities, nevertheless their law never completely disappeared, and it continues to provide inspiration for practitioners today. Gemma draws on this knowledge not only from published material but also from the experiences and workings of wise women and country witches living today. Topics include the cunning path, the dead and the underworld, the fairy faith, the buka, places of power in the villages and the landscape, the tools used by cunning folk, working versions of what can be seen for example in the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic village cunning, substances and charms, and rites of the years round. This book gathers so much material together, some of which has not been seen in print before, and thus provides a source book of magical workings in Cornwall today, which will be an invaluable reference. And damn right, it is so good. I will be honest, I did dog ear the pages until I realised how much I enjoyed the book, and then I undog eared the pages, and now they look a little bit, a little bit messy, but it's really really good. Inside it starts with information about the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic which is really useful if that's something you are interested in learning more about. You do have different workings in here so we have the Witch's Compass, the Troyal Hood, what else do we have in here? Places of Power, the Buka, we also have imagery and pictures which are really useful and they are also found within the hardback version which is great. It is essentially exactly the same book, just in a slightly different form. So just as an example, that is the exact same set of pictures that we just saw in the other book. So essentially, if you've got the original, you're not going to need the hardback. But I ended up getting it anyway, because I'm obsessed with this book and I love it so much. So yes, do with that information what you will. But this one is definitely one of my favourites that Troy Books has ever published. It's really good. Okay, next. I do want to say here, I have no affiliation with Troy Books whatsoever. I know this might seem like I do. I don't. I purchase these with my own money because I just love them so much. They don't know who I am, or at least I think they don't know who I am. Anyway, <laughs> I'm not affiliated with them at all. I just wanted to share the books that I got because I really love their works. Um, so yeah, I'm not being paid to do this or anything is basically what I'm trying to say. I just really enjoy it. And uh, my battery is dying, so fun. We're now on to the last three. So up first we have Granite by the Sea by Alex Langstone. And this is gorgeous. Once again, there's something about that copper print that is just, oh, I'm a sucker for it. And then the writing is in the same print down the side. It's beautiful. I'm really sad I missed out on the special edition for this one because the special edition was beautiful, but alas, I was not fortunate enough to get that. This one is really interesting because this one is another one about folklore, which isn't going to be for everyone. This is specifically about the folklore of Bodmin Moor and East Cornwall, which as I mentioned earlier is so rich in 
folklore and legends and stories and history, one of the most famous legends that people will likely have heard of, both from the UK and further afield, is the Beast of Bodmin, the Beast of Bodmin Moor, which is essentially a big cat legend and story, and many people to this day will still record sightings of big cats on Bodmin Moor, and this also applies to Exmoor and other places like that. So Exmoor is Devon, I should reiterate, otherwise people will get mad at me for saying that Exmoor is Cornwall. Exmoor is Devon and Bodmin is Cornwall. And this area of the UK has such rich legend and stories that learning about it is just fascinating to me. That's why I started the podcast in the first place, which that being said, some people have been asking me about it. I am scripting season two. I know it's been a few years since I did anything with it and it's because life has just been absolutely bonkers. So I'm really hoping that I can start filming that soon and then we can have a season two. Um, so let me know any legends and stories that you would like to hear more about and I will try to fit them in with coming episodes. Okay, with that being said, uh, let's talk about this book in particular. So Cornwall is an ancient land steeped in legend and myth. From Granite to Sea explores the folklore of the often overlooked eastern reaches of the rugged Cornish Peninsula, at the heart of which lies the mysterious upland of Bodmin Moor. This beautiful and remote land of granite, which forms the Cornish Highlands, inhabits 80 square miles across the central spine of eastern Cornwall, a wild and mysterious landscape where folklore permeates every hill, rock and river, inhabited by piskies, giants and conjurers, who in turn control the old trackways, hilltops and weather. It is a land haunted by the wild hunt of the devil's dandy dogs and the demonic spectre of the Tregeagle. Tregeagle. I have never read that word out loud before. I'm sorry if that's not right. <laughs> From Granite to Sea is the first ever comprehensive focus on the folklore of Eastern Cornwall. Alex Langstone's groundbreaking study will guide the reader through a myriad of old tales of witches, conjurers and charmers, supernatural encounters, amazing folk traditions and curious customs from the high moors, rugged clifftops, secret coves and lush estuaries. Alex Langstone is a folklorist, poet and author who has been fascinated by the innumerable legends, myths and folklore of the Cornish landscape for much of his life. And this one just looks so interesting. If you aren't looking at folklore, this isn't going to be for you. But if you're like me and you love learning about different places, the stories and legends, then this could be a really interesting read. Next up, we have Etruscan Roman Remains. Now, this one is definitely not going to be interesting to everyone. And I didn't even know that this was published. So that just shows how behind the times I am. But... I figured it looked interesting enough to give it a go, and if I was gonna be getting everything else, I may as well get this too. Also, look how beautiful the cover is. That's, that's ridiculous, and the side is just, it's gorgeous, it's gorgeous. So, <laughs> this one is really interesting in that it is by Charles Godfrey Leland, or Leyland, I never know how to say that. And it is an accompaniment to Aradia, the Gospel of Witches. If anyone's read that, it's really, really interesting. And so many modern traditions have been based on this work. And I have it, it's sitting just over there. I wanted to get that in a hardback as well, but I just didn't manage to get it before they all sold out. But this one reads as follows. To accompany our previous publication of Aradia, the Gospel of the Witches, we are delighted to introduce the Troy Books edition of the 1892 book, Etruscan Roman Remains in Popular Tradition by folklorist Charles Godfrey Leland. The book presents a fascinating collection of lore, magical charms, spells, divinations, necromatic rites, and spirit conjurations from the Tuscan region of Italy, with a particular focus on the beliefs and practices of Strigaria, or Italian traditional witchcraft. Now this is one I hadn't actually realised Troy Books had published a version of. You'll often find that similar books to this will be published by multiple different houses, like publishing houses, and I didn't realise that Troy Books had done this, so I'm really glad I managed to get hold of it, because it's one of those topics that I find really interesting. As with some of the others in this collection, it isn't necessarily something that I would practice myself, but it's something that I am really interested just to learn more about and have a bit of a deeper understanding of history. This, however, is massive. Like, this is so heavy. How many pages is this? It, it's not actually that many pages. It's like 400 pages, maybe. Maybe not even that, 300 and something pages. 
it's just, it's hefty. It is hefty, it's not gonna be for everyone, but if this is something that you were interested in, then Troy Books does a version of it if that's something that you were looking into. And then lastly, we have The Book of Witches by Oliver Maddox Hufer. And this is one that I have had my eye on for a good while. And I kept, as with so many of the others, I kept putting it down and I ended up never getting it. And then this time I went, you know what? We're just gonna get it. This one is another one that's actually a much older book. So some of the ones that Troy Books publishes are by modern authors, for instance, Gemma Gary or Nigel Pearson. There are others that are much, much older works like this one, like Etruscan Roman Remains that are a lot older that have essentially been republished by Troy Books. And this is one of them. So the information on this goes as follows. First published in 1909, the Book of Witches represents an intriguing exploration of the witch as a vital archetype, dwelling within humanity's shadows. Oliver Maddox Hufer offers an account of ideas and beliefs surrounding witchcraft held at the beginning of the 20th century, and reaches back into prehistory and onward to investigate the origins and meanings of witchcraft, its history, folklore, practices, and persecutions woven through with traditional charms, spells, and magical lore. And this is one of those that I just want to sink my teeth into. This is my favourite kind of book on the subject, honestly. As much as I love modern books on the subject that are very much personal practice, I really enjoy seeing historical practice and historical belief systems. And while this might not necessarily be 100% accurate to the beliefs of the time, it's interesting to see someone's perspective on it, because often there is a degree of truth in there. And so this is one where, while it is going to be rather history heavy, heavy, I suspect. I am looking forward to giving it a read and I love the little illustrations that they've got on the top of each of the chapters. This is something that we see in a lot of Troy Books books as you do have these illustrations, but obviously because this is a much older work, it is done in a slightly different way to the other ones. So this is a really famous illustration many of you will have likely seen. If you buy clothes from Disturbia, this is on some of their t-shirts, is this print of the witches dancing with the devil in a circle. I just, I love stuff like this. So that is everything that I got from Troy Books that was not a pre-order. I did get one, maybe two pre-orders while I was at it because I figured I'm already paying for shipping. I may as well get these ones as well. <laughs> so I did get, how many did I get? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I don't know, I've lost count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 books, and then a few pre-orders as well. So yeah, did I go a little overboard? Some might say so, but I really hope that you found this video enjoyable. Perhaps that you found some books that you would like to add into your own collection, if that's something that you are interested in, or if there's any books in this that you would like me to do a review of, let me know and I can always do that, whether it's on Patreon or whether it's on here, I'm not sure where I'm gonna put it, but yeah. I'm so excited to give these a read. The only problem I've got, I have to find a place to put them. This bookshelf is basically full. It's wonky now, but that's because there's books from like live streams that are still kind of piled up. That bookshelf is full. The bookshelf in my living room is full. The bookshelf in my bedroom is full, which means I might need to buy a new bookshelf because after all, there is no such thing as too many books, only too few bookshelves. And I am very much feeling that right now. If you like Troy books as much as I do, which book is your absolute favorite? Or if you're interested in any of these books in this video, let me know which one that you would be most interested in reading yourself. With that being said, I hope that you did enjoy this video. If you did, feel free to give it a like. It means a lot to me. If you've got any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the comment section. And if you do enjoy the magical content on this channel or in this video, feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week. So with that being said, I hope you're all staying safe. I hope you have a marvelous magical day and I will see you in the next video. Bye. If you're ever wondering what it's like to be me, I just spent five minutes searching for a camera that I just put on a tripod. <laughs> I'm not even joking. My object permanence is so bad that the minute I turned away from my camera, I forgot it existed and I then went searching for it. <laughs> We're gonna pretend like that didn't just happen. Mm -hmm.